retrogrades. How to re-evangelize the de-Christianized West. Support us in any way you can, most especially by your prayers. From an authentically Catholic perspective. Right-minded, righteous group that's equal in strength to the radicals. From an authentically masculine perspective. You and your friends versus me and my friends. Bring it on. Welcome everybody to Rules for Retrogrades. We're excited to bring you a special episode today with Mr. Michael J. Knowles. It's J, right, Mike? Yeah. It is J, yeah. Stan, okay. just like our president. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Donald J. Trump, <laughs> Timothy J. Gordon, Michael J. Knowles. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we're, we're excited, Dave, Chris, and I, to have you on. We have a special announcement here today that you're going to be, uh, you know, working with Rules for Retrogrades on. Well, our book, aren't you? You're going to be forwarding it. That's that's exciting. And we wanted to clear up a rumor before it even begins. That rumor would be after the Susan from Parish Council interview, people see your, your association, your friendship with us here on Rules for Retrogrades. We wanted to say Michael is not Susan from Parish Council. So welcome, Michael, to the Th show. Thank you for that introduction. It's very important because one thing I value more than just about anything else is, is dialogue and encounter. So I just right. want, in the spirit of dialogue and encounter, I want to make clear, I am not Susan from the Parish Council, but I'm very excited to be writing the foreword to your book, to Rules for Retrogrades. And I'm, I'm really honored, especially because the only other book I've ever written was completely blank. So I'm glad that you could have uh, seen that as a good testament that I should uh, then write the, in, the foreword with words to your next book. It's a great honor. <laughs> the argument was very tight in that. In that it book. was. It the was, one who, yeah. And convincing, yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, enough, <laughs> enough said, right? But the authorship <laughs> is totally untested, though. Uh, we we assume you're illiterate, sir. <laughs> well, we'll find out, I guess. <laughs> now, the joke will be you get us the forward, and we're like, oh, bro, this is a blank document. You're like, that's, that's what I do. That's my, <laughs> right. that's that's my document. You've, see, you've seen what, my you work. You know? I'm, <laughs> I'm the John Cage of uh, literary figures. Yeah. <laughs> but there will be footnotes and endnotes, right? Mm -hmm, that's absolutely blank. right. Right, okay. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, so Mike, we, uh, yeah, of course, meet meet Dave, uh, little brother Dave and, and Chris the Ginger. They were excited to have you on, and uh, we, as am I. So everybody meet one another, four, four squares or rectangular squares. Hey, hey. How's it going? <laughs> nice to, nice nice to meet you guys and good to be on, yeah. Yeah, nice but to meet just you. Just to clear up one thing about the, the middle initial being J, uh, Michael, is that for John? I know Timothy, Timothy John, of course, my brother. You know how all women have the middle name Marie? Is it like mm -hmm. that? You all just right. have the middle name John? That's it, Michael John Knowles. You've guessed okay. it. Yeah. What a match. What the a only match. alternative could have been like Homer Simpson, Homer J J A Y Simpson, but it's not that <laughs> John, just like you. Yeah, there is a rumor going around in the late '90s because we were we were Simpsons nuts back then uh, that that the J for Homer J Simpson was just J with no period and no A Y. Where, where did you get uh, yeah J A Y? I'm gonna have to research that. Mm -hmm. But that's it's, uh, it's talk important. about canon. We, I mean, you know, I think uh, <laughs> yeah. the Simpsons has gone on so long that. Simpsons canon is probably even more opaque and obscure than the canon of the church, but I, we'll, have, we'll be able to uh, delve both of them, I'm sure, yeah, in the episode. The <laughs> most overly rewritten canon in the history of all canon is Star Wars. It goes Star Wars canon, now Catholic Church canon, and then, then Simpsons canon, I guess. Excuse so me, I believe, right. I don't think you mean rewritten, I think you mean developed and evolving and i don't know what other words not that's according right. to trent horn according to trent horn rewritten you know? yeah that's, just, that's ooh, what i've heard ooh. i've heard that well we're it's 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 been live lately with the uh the trent horn doctrine can change intrinsic evil can be historically conditioned this is this is a big deal have you been following the the trent horn Tim Gordon you, debate follow we 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 met for dinner right after it Mike right crying. afterward yes and I so you you described it to me and then I've just seen these snippets of you know especially on Twitter and which is this is actually something I really love about conservative Catholics more than any other group of any other religion 
is it, it, it reminds me of what I once heard is the difference between Bill Clinton and Rudy Giuliani is Bill Clinton can walk into any room and talk to any person and find the one thing that they agree on. And Rudy Giuliani, just like all conservative Catholics, can walk into any room and talk to any person and find the one thing you disagree on. <laughs> and it makes conversation much more interesting. Right. That's, that's true. Well, Trent and I that day, full disclosure, we found a couple. So, and, uh, yeah, true. It's true. And by the way, if there's only a two minute clip or snippet, as you say, left of that interview, that's not a snippet. That's the full thing that they left that they haven't redacted. So <laughs> there we go. I need a I need a rim shot there because they're, they're literally cutting it up over at Catholic Answers. It's, it went from like an hour 45 to now it's like 45 minutes. Um, really? Nevertheless. Wow. Yeah. yeah well, you saw me that day. I was flabbergasted. I'd traveled from San Diego to L.A. We had dinner at the lovely restaurant near your place. I was a you customer. You just got out of the SAT. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. <all about. laughs> yeah. Wow. I've got to I've got to start doing that with my own interviews. If uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I do these long interviews and then if, you know, occasionally someone gets the better of me, I've got to I'll just cut it down to like a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. Did you? I, I, I've never heard. <laughs> Seems fair. Heard. Seems right. fair. Yeah. Well, it's 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 becoming the Catholic answers way, and it, it's it's what we're saying about Ken is the becoming the Catholic way of the church. Well, let, let's let's jump um, into the pool, hip deep there, uh, Michael. If I, I saw you tweeting about this last week, so uh, VP Biden was denied Holy Communion by the Catholic priest Father Mori, and there's all kinds of fallout. The first off, we were cheering loudly dave was dave was maybe cheering the loudest of anyone i'd heard here on our i think it was our second show we were really pumped we were really happy but the likes of cardinal dolan i think you spent some time in in new york right the likes of oh, cardinal yeah. dolan and everybody else jumped on and said this is the wrong response at the wrong time and of course biden went on to say that uh pope francis never denies him what are we to make of this what do you what do you think well, I guess there's a school of thought that believes that we ought to treat the Eucharist as the Eucharist. And there's a school of thought that says that what Catholics should desire most is the approval of this world. I guess it's about as simple as that. I mean, e e in the case of New York, uh, even at the passage of that absolutely horrific abortion bill that allowed babies to be killed not merely in the womb, but even as they're being born up until the moment of birth, that literally changed the penal code to remove protections for unborn babies that were already in the law, and you have a nominally Catholic governor of New York and Andy Cuomo facing no consequences by his religious superiors, no excommunication, no nothing. A couple of somewhat critical television interviews by priests and archbishops and cardinals, that's it? That's all, that all, that's all he has to deal with. I thought it was so helpful that uh, Joe Biden was denied communion for openly, not, not only uh, defending uh, the killing of a million babies a year in the United States, but actually saying we need to liberalize these laws and we need to force people to pay for it. I thought it was very important. And, and actually, sort of in Joe Biden's defense, I think Joe Biden was genuinely shocked to have been denied communion, not only because he's a leftist politician, but because so many Catholics of his generation, so many Catholics who maybe they go to church, maybe they don't, but they take things a little lightly and loosey-goosey, they, they would never hesitate to receive the Eucharist. They would probably not avail themselves of the sacraments all the time. For them, it's become a bit of a custom, something to be taken lightly. And we know you should never take the Eucharist lightly. You should never receive the Eucharist lightly. It's, it's the sacrament. And uh, so even beyond the political question of abortion, which is very important, I, th I think what that priest did is, is also remind all of us of the, of the significance of the Eucharist. And uh, unfortunately, I bet the lesson is going to be lost on a lot of liberal and likely older Catholics. But, but the young Catholics are watching, and it seems to me we're taking it a lot more seriously. They're talking about Susan from the parish council, right? <laughs> I'm talking only about Susan. <laughs> and on that note, I think what, what the problem is, it would be one thing if the, the whole church and all of our bishops would unite around priests that have the courage to do things like this. But we're, what we're going to see is this phenomenon of the liberal bishops rushing into white knight for, for Joe Biden or 
you know, for whatever liberal politician it is that's going to get denied communion, and they're going to show up and say, look at this uh, intolerant, bigoted priest, he's stuck in the olden days, and that really muddles the message, it waters down the message, it waters down people's faith in the Holy Eucharist, which is, of course, a, a terrible thing, you know, it's the source and summit of our faith, it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, and to take it lightly, to not be absolutely uniform and ubiquitous in our message of reverence for the Eucharist in, in the gravity that we we render to it um, is going to be devastating for the faith of people who are going to see it more like Protestants, like it's a, a bit of crackers and you, you know, you wash it down with a shot of grape juice from a little plastic cup. Right, I refer to that take of it as the salvific amuse-bouche, you know, it doesn't have much <laughs> more significance than a sort of physical and symbolic appetizer of, of salvation, and, and that uh, creates scandal. I mean, and that, that's really what this whole episode shows us, is the scandal of having the most prominent Catholic politicians in the country not take their faith seriously. Scandal is not just when a guy gets caught with his pants down. Scandal <laughs> is when you, when, when one commits an act that leads other people astray and breeds confusion in matters of faith. And we've had it among the left in the United States, certainly since John F. Kennedy, who, who gave his famous speech and said, more or less, I'm a Catholic, but don't worry, that won't affect any of the way I think or behave. And, and most especially, you see that with Mario Cuomo, the father of the current governor of New York, and all of the politicians of that era, including Joe Biden, who said, I'm a Catholic in my personal life, but I'm, I, I don't know, not a Catholic in my public life. And that, that creates this false dualism, a dualism that has to be utterly rejected and has always been rejected by the church and, and yet has been the chief political tactic of at least nominal leftist Catholics in the United States. It's a great scandal and it's, it's being exposed. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's why we need, a, we need a playbook to, to fight back. That's what, that's what we're all about here on Rules for Retrogrades. So just one quick correction. The Catholic Encyclopedia, I believe, updated scandal to include only when the pants are having to be taken <laughs> off the ground. Right. I need the new edition of it. That's right. <laughs> you do. They update it once a year now. Yeah. It's just a picture it's, of Anthony Weiner, actually, on there. Yeah. <laughs> It's like the the eleventh edition of the New Speak Dictionary. You know, it was all no. This was always what it meant. It's, right. We were always right. at war with East Asia. Right. That's right. Well, if you know anything, not to bring everything back to the the Trent Horn issue, but they, the Catholic Answers actually had a 2016 article where they said doctrine can't change. Right after we debated that night. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I ago, must say I changed it. I, I speak a little bit from ignorance here because I've I've always used Catholic Answers and I found it to be a great resource. So as you're saying, you know, if if it's going a little weak, that's a that's a, a very scary thing to hear because it's always been a, a great resource. And so if uh, if now even that is is becoming tough to use, you wonder where can young Catholics turn? Well, we're always one generation away from tyranny, and like you, um, it's been my experience that Catholic Answers has always been very faithful, and it helped bring me back into the bosom of the church from kind of um, yeah, me too. a loud and raucous youth. So I've always had nothing but respect for them, but I, I think it's the height of respect to kind of call people back to sobriety who have gotten off the tried and true path, and it seems to be that during the, you know, the latter years of this pontificate that's been the direction but you know we want to give every every benefit of the doubt and express our gratitude and appreciation to what has always been you know a faithful publication it is that is the fear though is the the latter years of this pontificate and and the confusion that seems to come from it because on the one hand you can say well the media are misrepresenting what we're hearing even from pope francis on the other hand, you have to wonder why, why keep talking to those same people in the media? I mean, why keep speaking to Eugenio Scalfari at La Repubblica if every time, you know, the Pope speaks to this journalist, he's apparently completely misquoted, then maybe you should stop giving interviews. Uh, right. that, that confusion is a, a big problem because, you know, people have a lot of questions about the faith. The 10,000 questions doesn't make one doubt, but there are a lot of questions. And so if, if reliable resources, and I'm not just talking about websites, I'm talking about the uh, Holy See itself, if, if they're becoming less reliable and they're breeding more confusion, I mean, the, the, 
the downstream effects of that are incalculable. That's right. It's well said. That's right. It's well said. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, remember the, the good Archbishop Fulton Sheen, I think all four of us here have a, a, a tremendous amount of respect and veneration for, for the good Archbishop, the good late Archbishop. He used to say, if you don't act as you believe, soon you will believe as you act. This, this is not just the moral habits in the Aristotelian life, it's all the, also the intellectual habits. And so one fears for good, venerable places like Catholic Answers that the first two, three, four years of the pontificate are now catching up with him, and they've conditioned themselves, maybe, to just pope splain at, at every turn. You know? <laughs> I like that and term. We can't... <laughs> coffin. That's a coffinism. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But we got to be careful, too, because, you know, having worked at an apostolate that had some dysfunction in it, some of these things are coming from middle and upper management. So we can never know when it's the foot troops that are being kind of directed into the wrong place. Uh, yeah, kind of misdirected versus when it's, you know, them, the apologists themselves off the track. So there is that thing of benefit of the doubt. But Catholic Answers should take note that, you know, we're always one generation away from tyranny. So things, the tree of liberty, the tree of uh, orthodoxy has to be refreshed from time to time with the blood of martyrs and patriots, right? That's a good, that's a good uh, paraphrasing of Jefferson. That's a good way to put <laughs> Thank it. Thank you. Right. The tree of, uh, who was it? Saint, which saint cut down the pagan tree in the 700s? We Boniface. were just talking about him. Yeah, Boniface. Yeah, the tree of the pagans needs to be cut down every generation anew. <laughs> was that the same tree that was then used to carve Pachamama? I, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm confused about which tree that was. I haven't read, but I'm guessing. I mean, I mean come on, except we don't cut down <laughs> pagan trees anymore. We bring them into the... Uh, Mike, wh <laughs> we put what? them in the church. We, plan we put them in the church. <laughs> yeah, and we, we allow the uh, indigenous peoples to prostrate themselves before them on October the 6th. What was going on with that, Mike, by the way? I, I mean, what the heck? I've tried as best I can to ignore this Amazon Synod, other than Susan from the Parish Council's reporting on it, because I, I felt that was a, a sufficient, sufficient interpretive lens. But I've tried my best to ignore it, because I understand that the plural of anecdote is not data, but I, I go almost exclusively to Latin masses, whether it's the Norbertines or FSSP. I mean, I'm, I travel a lot, so I go to a lot of different churches, and the, I see when I go to those masses, it's all young people, and they all are right. median age, probably 25, and they all have 10 kids somehow, and they're full parishes, you know, and they're really full churches. And then I'll occasionally go to, you know, the Pachamama church down the street and it's like three Susan from the parish councils <laughs> and they don't have, they, they shut down uh, c confession. I went to try to go to confession at one of these churches about two weeks ago and they, without marking anything about it, they just didn't show up for confession because they wanted to have a carnival instead. I kid you not. <laughs> and so I just look, I look at that and it's it's basically like the meme going around the internet. The OK Boomer meme is you have these 70-year-olds saying what the youths really want is Pachamama. Meanwhile, the real youths That's are playing, right. their, playing their rosary every night and, and chanting in Latin. And it's right. just such an unbelievable divorce of the imaginations of people who came of age in the 1970s and the reality of millennials and Gen Z who are just want any orthodoxy whatsoever to ground themselves in this in this hippy dippy free floating world of of subjective feelings and and the tyranny of relativism that's a hot take I, I think what the older <laughs> no. generations don't get is that the 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 young people that are left in the church are the ones who actually believe i right. i think that these this older generation i think they stopped believing at least, you know, one or two things of the faith or maybe the faith altogether, but they just stayed. They just stayed in the church and they're like, well, this is home. But for the younger generation, it's like, they don't believe. They just, you know, they, they go to a Dodger game or they, they do something else. They find something. Right. So the people that are left in the church, the young people, are people that actually believe and that's why they want the Latin Mass. They actually believe Jesus is truly present there. So, it, and they a want a little bit disconnect. of 
they, they also want a little bit of beauty. You know, beauty has been under assault in the West for at least a hundred years, if not more. Mm -hmm. And it's given us these hideous buildings in our cities, these yeah. even more hideous buildings in the suburbs, hideous music, and uh, and some of that music yeah. has infiltrated the churches in the form of those sappy 1970s pop songs. And and so you have this these two generations, at least, millennial and Gen Z, and, and I guess I'd put Gen X in there too, who grew up in a church that was it, it, the parish council and Susan did the best they could to ban beauty from the church. Now there's something about the the mass itself that is just intrinsically beautiful. You can't take all the beauty out of it. But when when the liturgy is is reverent and appropriate and proper, it's so overwhelmingly beautiful that I, I think people who are lapsed Catholics or n converts or were never Catholic or atheist, they just hear that, they see that beauty, and they're just drawn to it because we have such an aesthetic desert that we're all living in. That's, That's great. great. Yeah, what, yeah. Yeah. what do you think about the, uh, the, the removing of the crucifix and putting... Have you seen in L.A. here the resurrected Jesus that they have? It's like they they don't want to show Christ crucified. They they want to show Jesus resurrected. It's on. It's in a lot of churches. I'm I'm yeah. pleased to have avoided most of those churches, yeah. though I do know what you're talking about. I mean, I've yeah. seen similar sorts of things, and it's yeah, it's it's just a. It was such a miscalculation. From I mean, we're talking about a miscalculation from the same era that gave us disco and brutalism. So you know, they they made a lot of mistakes <laughs> in that time period. But the the miscalculation was that. The wave of the future was some kind of sappy mainline Protestantism. And, of course, the mainline Protestant churches are even emptier than these hippy-dippy Catholic parishes. And, and so uh, it gives us, you know, ugly, ugly architecture and really bizarre understandings of the symbols and the icons that have, have so enriched the faith over its two millennia of existence, all for some kind of cheap, fashionable... A political message, but of course, if you, it was a Dean Inge who said, if you wed yourself to the spirit of the age, you'll find yourself a widow in the next, and that's why Susan from the parish council is a widow. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know, yeah. it, it's funny, they say the key to, to all psychology is really understanding yourself, knowing what you believe. And I think there's a lot of projection from the baby boomer generation of, of what they believe onto the latter generations, which is funny because they don't understand that they were the aberration. You know, just because their generation kind of fell into debauchery and counterculturalism, they project that onto all of us, onto the youth uh, that are coming up in the church. And like Chris said, the ones that have remained, the youth that have remained, there's no purpose if they didn't really believe because the culture has gotten so lax, um, our rituals have gotten so so lax, and we fall, you know, many have fallen away from them. So the ones that are still in the church are the true believers, right? And they don't understand that true believers, obviously by definition, aren't just there for because they're cultural Catholics. Anyone who's a youth in the church is in the church because they really, really believe. You know, right. So, right. Yeah. And I, I don't, you know, I, I sometimes fear that my, what I think are just simply honest observations about that generational gap, but I sometimes fear it, it borders on the edge of disrespect, which I certainly don't mean to give at all. But there, there is a certain sort of filial piety that comes from absolute honesty. And really what we're requesting of the baby boomers and the hippy-dippy types who want to throw the liturgy out the window and who want to give us hor horrific art and acoustic guitar masses is we don't even want them to, to necessarily say, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, I ruined everything. I don't care about that. I just want them to have some humility to understand right. that their their aberration of vision of the church is is just that precisely as you say an aberration and to have the humility to to look at other generations of catholics the one who came the the, the generations who came before them the generations who took the oath against modernism for instance and the generations who are coming after them who coincidentally are looking at those very same <laughs> sort of oaths against modernism and re and reacting to to the the uh, desolation of this modern and postmodern church and say hmm maybe we got a couple things wrong maybe we ought to step back and yet instead what are we seeing they're trying harder and harder to suppress 
the return to a beautiful liturgy. I mean, in the National Catholic Distorter, just uh, I'm sorry, the National Catholic Reporter just the other day, they ran that piece about yeah. how the uh, Latin Mass, as, as has been practiced for, what, 600, 700 years, uh, with a little break in the middle after Vatican II, how it's a hotbed of toxic traditionalism. I mean, in the face of that, what can you do? You can either laugh or cry. Yeah, the, it, it's it's actually kind of uh, you can tell that there's an agenda there because I don't know if you've uh, if you've um, paid close attention to this push for women deacons, but it's fascinating how these same people will go back to the ancient church. They'll be like, "Ooh, there was this one time in which this woman was called a deaconess, and therefore we need to reclaim this ancient tradition of the church." You're like, "What are you talking? Anything pre-Vatican II?" That doesn't fit their agenda, they want to get rid of, including Jesus, because he's pre-Vatican too. But when it comes to the Latin Mass and all these beautiful traditions that have come down to us through the ages, they want to get rid of, unless it fits their agenda, then they're like, oh, look, this one woman in Syria was happened to be ordained, or was it called a deaconess? It, right. It's, right. it's mind-boggling. There's like such the an first... irony. Go ahead. So, well, there's, there's such an irony, because this article that was in the National Catholic Reporter said that all of us awful millennial Catholics who are the ones going to the Latin masses, we are this hotbed of toxic traditionalism and of Catholic fundamentalism. But, uh, but of course, they are the fundamentalists in the same way that fundamentalists right. are simply incorrect, meaning they find this one reference to a deaconess in Syria from the, I don't know, the third century or something, and they they take that and they say, here's an example. If we really want to be the true Catholics, we need to go all the way back here. Or they find some example of a ceremony, any sort of religious ceremony, between people of the same sex, and they say, see, this is evidence of ancient Christian gay marriage, and so we're now we're going to redefine marriage. That is fundamentally the argument of a fundamentalist. And mm -hmm. what fundamentalists get wrong is they completely misunderstand tradition, which is not just something that happened a long time ago. Tradition is as new and as fresh as anything because it has survived through the ages. It has endured, and that is what we're trying to preserve. We're not trying to take a snapshot of something that happened in the year 173 in the middle of Syria and then r interpret that through our modern lens. We simply right. want to preserve the wisdom and the beauty of the ages, which is precisely the opposite of, of what they're trying to do. There right. seems to always be a false antiquarianism at the heart of progressivism and, and radicalism, right? I mean, I, I make this point to Dave and Chris all the time about Vatican II, which invites all a, a whole spectrum of reasonable, I think, retrograde conservative positions. But what I say about the Pariti, the fathers at, at Vatican II, when they were saying, resource a maw, resource a maw, let's go back to the sources. This sounds pretty good. It doesn't sound like the stuff of radicals, does it? But what it really meant, it, it was byplay for let's, let's, they're saying, you know, patristics, patristics, but what they really meant is let's just get around the scholastics in between. Yeah. That's what right. it ends up being. False antiquarianism seems to be, a, a, as far as things are turning out in America, which has a different brand of radical, or the church, which has a different brand of radical than France or Russia. Um, places that are tethered to um, tradition, like the church or like America, I see a lot of parallel here, the progressives and the radicals there have to operate by a kind of false antiquarianism. And of course right, they so can never they can never answer the basic question. So if they'll say, I mean, one, one of the arguments for reconciliation rooms is the same kind of antiquarian argument that, well, in the way, way back olden days, people looked at each other face to face, and so therefore we're going to ditch the confessional. They never seem to ask the question, why did the confessional come into use in the first place? I mean, it's as simple as Chesterton's fence. They're ripping out the, the fence in the middle of the road without ever even contemplating the question of how the fence got there in the first place. That, that is, it's the kind of difference that John Stuart Mill uh, described between the radical Jeremy Bentham and the conservative Thomas Carlyle. He said, Bentham, the radical, looks at a received opinion and says simply, is it true? In this very narrow way that I'm looking at the truth, is it true, yes or no? If it's not, throw it out. And what the conservative Carlyle looks at is he sees a received opinion and he says, what does it mean? That, of course, is the much more adult and mature way of looking at something. And it's, and it's the way that's going to help you get the most wisdom out of it. Mm -hmm. Right. The young, uh, I think the young liberal 
sees an idea and he says, well, I don't understand the purpose of this idea, so let's get rid of it. The young conservative sees an idea and says, I don't understand the purpose of this idea. Before I get rid of it, I better understand its purpose. Right. And yeah, along, I just wanted to add on the tradition thing, we hear all the resource of Ma speak, um, and it is in many cases um, used to kind of circumvent tradition, but that's silly because tradition is itself the living memory of the church. So it's not, you know, it, it's foolish to go and reinvent the wheel when we can draw upon the church's living memory, which is in continuity with, with authentic development throughout the ages. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Mike, what, uh, so this is kind of all beggaring the question about that turns out to be the namesake for the show retrogrades. I don't know if you know, it, the, the term comes from WikiLeaks in what, what was that? November 2nd, 2016, uh, where it, it's from a, a quotation made by at that point, speaker of the house, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, and it's it's a Hillary staffer calls the Ca American Catholic Church in reference to the USCCB, which they're trying to infiltrate. It, you know, convinced me they did a good job of that. They said it's a seriously retrograde church. The Democrat infiltration, in other words, into the American church seems all but complete. And uh, yeah, what, what, what are we to make of a, a springtide of the Catholic Church, particularly in America? Because like I say... What? You've read my book. I, America and the and the church are two of the greatest forces, the church more infinitely so, for tradition and uh, long memory than any other than any other institutions in the world, especially the church. Of course, the idea of the Catholic spring, as I forget if it was Podesta or, or Newman, the person that he was corresponding with, called for this Catholic spring. And I think that would turn out about as well as the Arab spring turned out, which is not to say uh, not, not, not very well. Uh, this desire, this, this uh, assault on the Catholic Church, the retrograde church, is a perennial one. The church has faced these major obstacles consistently, and now it has become almost cliche to observe every 500 years is a major problem that the church has to deal with. For the first 500 years, it was the Arian heresy, then it was Albigensianism, then it was Protestantism, and now who knows what we would call it, all of which are calling for a transformation of the Catholic Church. And it, 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 to use Hilaire Belloc's observation, it is just a proof of the divine institution of the Catholic Church because, as, as Belloc said, any human institution, any merely human institution conducted with such navis Im imbecility would not have lasted a fortnight. So the fact that the Catholic <laughs> Church has made it through all of those is a, a great testament to it. But this, this uh, call of, of retrograde is, is merely to say that you're not a progressive. You're, you don't have a capital P. You're not on that utopian path to to nowhere i mean that utopian <laughs> path into into a nightmare and if i mean that is literally what the word would mean and if if that's the title they're going to give me i'd i'll wear it proudly us too <laughs> so um michael i'd like to kind of step back and, and zoom out a little bit um you know i know you do a lot of speaking engagements and you're an excellent speaker and very entertaining Thanks. one uh, and yeah, I've been watching some of your stuff on YouTube and you have some really good insights. So just to zoom out a little bit, if you'd indulge me, what do you think the most serious problem presently facing the Western world is? This will seem a, an overly simplistic answer perhaps, but it is what it is. The, the biggest problem is the decline of religious faith and specifically Christianity and specifically Catholicism. That's the greatest problem. That is the root of all of the other problems. It's the root not merely in the decay of our politics, but also the decay of our culture. We're, we're, I, I would be surprised if they can rebuild Notre Dame, not because they don't have the money and not because they don't have the builders, but because they don't have the sense of beauty and the artistic vision. And it's, it's at the root of our, our birth rate problem, it's a, which is profound. It's at the root, therefore, of our immigration problem. And it's at the root of, of a recurring problem that is, is really threatening to destroy our politics, which is 
identity politics. Uh, identity politics that the left has been harping on for at least 60 years, probably closer to 100, and which the right occasionally adopts as well. Identity politics meaning forming a kind of politics of race or sex that is rooted not in reason to arguments and persuading your fellow citizens, but in the brutal interests of irreconcilable groups who are defined by their physical differences rather than by some sort of patriotic unity or ideological unity even. Th that's a big problem, and, and the reason that that all derives from the lack of religiosity is because of the nature of identity itself. God is... Right. God is, right? I am that I am. Before, before Abraham was, I am. God defines himself as being itself. If you root your identity, your fundamental identity, in God, as we are called to do by God repeatedly, then the world starts to make a little bit more sense. Your life starts to make a little bit more sense, and you can live in a harmonious republic. If you've severed that understanding of yourself and your identity, then you are left with a pathetic question, which is, who am I? You're like a pitiful little 16-year-old <laughs> flower child who says, I'm going out to find myself and dabble in drugs and all sorts of, of dereliction. Not, <laughs> not out of any real fault of their own, other than their own ignorance and their own lack of mooring in, in the eternal reality and the identity of God. That identity politics then causes people on the left to say, by virtue of my sexual preferences, I belong to this group, and politics will just be based on my raw interests, or even if you're on the right. I mean, some of the far-right far groups who trace their fundamental identity down to their, the color of their skin or in, in a longer heritage to some sort of German pagan roots or, or some <laughs> sense of the, the race, you know. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's equally pathetic, and it's equally wrong. You're, you're not going to have a thriving republic. You're certainly not going to have any s sort of uh, harmonious self-government based on that. Until you recover the religiosity, I every other sort of improvement you're making is just putting lipstick on a pig. How is that done? How do we recover it? You know, that's a, it's a great answer. And it's, the uh, pig? I think you're the very lipstick? shrewd. <laughs> not the lipstick so much. Uh, you, so you sounded like you thought that was a good idea. Like, how, which color, which shade? Yeah, what, yeah, what, what, would, uh, what kind of pig is are we Mac talking about? Makeup, what brand? Yeah, no. Yeah, I don't, is, would that be... Religiosity? Right, they, it, it, well, the, the way to recover religiosity is to answer these, these two essential things that are lacking in modern life, which is the uh, uh, lack of faith in reality and a lack of awareness of beauty. And I, I think young people are longing for that. Roger Scruton, the great British conservative philosopher, genius. is on a, a genius guy. I mean, he's just so admirable. And he's on a quest in government to not to engage in some kind of particular political philosophy or some political angling at 10 Downing Street. No, his project is to beautify country housing or to look at public housing. That would seem like such a strange task for a conservative philosopher and someone who's been so involved in politics. But it isn't really because Scruton's idea is that the only way that you're going to get people to love their country uh, is to give them some place to love, give them beautiful places. People won't want to be in places that are ugly. We've, we've adopted this awful modern idea that form follows function. That's why we have all these ugly buildings in the cities. The idea that the building is just built for business, let's say, for transactions. But form doesn't follow function here because nobody has any function to do in those buildings because no one wants to be there because they're so damn ugly. And I think if we gave people a little taste of beauty, that would draw them back. Now, that's not sufficient. That isn't the end of it. But it, it, the same goes for objective reality. Uh, un ironically, unbelievably, I've given dozens and dozens of speeches on college campuses on many topics, some of which are genuinely controversial. And yet the most controversial speech I gave was at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where I said, men are not women. And it caused an uproar, a near riot in the room, and then a guy busted in a fire door and tried to attack me. <laughs> because I said the men are not women. So I renamed the rest of my tour that, and, and the students took such issue with it. The, the kind of normal students, the right-wingers, the centrists, the moderates, the 
normal people who don't have much of a political opinion at all, were so thrilled to hear that basic statement. They found it refreshing, and I, I see it on campuses all over the place. And the left was as furious as they could ever be, because what it called into stark light was not some kind of esoteric political conversation, but the nature of reality itself. It, it yeah. showed that they, they cannot force their, their delusions to become reality on the rest of us. If you just give people a little taste of that reality, that's a beautiful thing. And you're not going to do that with felt banners. <laughs> you're not going to do that with, with soft soap. C.S. Lewis put it very well, which is that if you look for truth, you might find comfort in the end. But if you look for comfort, you'll find neither comfort nor truth, only soft soap and wishful thinking to begin, and in the end, despair. And any religious movement that tries to give people soft soap and comfort primarily is, is not going to succeed at anything. But fortunately, because of terrible retrogrades like you fellas, you know, and, uh, and other young Catholics, I think we're, we're beginning to put the truth above all things, and it's, it's attractive. And I think at a, in a slow way, it is beginning to restore that, that sense of religiosity. I mean, even the, the success of Jordan Peterson attests to this. Jordan Peterson is no rock-ribbed Orthodox Christian or anything like that, but he's at least raising the prospect of religious questions. And people who have been deprived of this their whole lives are flocking to him. Ernest Hemingway yeah. said, uh, he said, things happen gradually, then suddenly. I think right. we're in that gradually phase, but I, I think we, we could be surprised by how quickly a return to religious understanding uh, comes to us. I feel like Chris Farley, when he's interviewing uh, um, Paul McCartney, you know, after after Paul, Mc, Paul McCartney answers, he's like, awesome, you know, awesome. Yeah, he's, he points wow. out. You know, the universe, yeah. man, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah that's yeah. a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think um, what we need most is is boldness. I think that people deep down know that there's objective truth. You know, you were talking about a, a crisis of identity, and you can see this uh, um, where where women think they're men, men think they're women. But, you know, every crisis, both personal and social, begins with a crisis of identity. You don't know who you are. You, uh, you don't know where you've come from and so on and so forth. But at the heart of the crisis of identity is a crisis of story. And the West, for the last several decades, several hundred years, really, has been, has been telling a story in which uh, it involves that there really is no objective reality. There's no objective truth. Universals yeah. are pure names, nominalism, starting off with Marsilius of Padua and William of Ockham. And what yeah. you see is just this, this has been going on for the last several hundred years, and now we're seeing the fruit of it. And so no, it's not necessarily good arguments. I mean, Edward Fazer is really popular right now because he's doing that. But, but the thing that you're doing, which is boldness, it, it, it wakes people up. That's what's really needed. We need the arguments, but boldness so that people sort of just feel shocked out of this this sort of dogmatic slumber, whatever there, it is, this illusion that there is no such thing as, as objective truth, objective reality. You know, well, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate it. I... I do see your point in the in just sort of shaking people, especially. One thing that does this, ironically, is the transgender ideology, which obviously is absurd, the idea that you can be a, a, a man, you look like a man, you're, you have all the features of a man, but somehow on the inside, uh, you're really a woman. And you can't point to where that is. They, they occasionally make the argument that it's in the brain, but of course the brain is part of the body, so that falls apart. And then usually what they make is this argument of Gnostic dualism that, that you, you know, on, on a physical level you're a man, but on a deeply metaphysical level you're a woman. And therefore, the physical world has absolutely nothing to do with your real identity because you are not your body, which is really just just Catharism or, or Albigensianism. I mean, it's a thousand-year-old heresy that we've done away with. At least, however, at least, the transgender ideologues are trying to ask the question about the soul. I'll take a transgender ideologue over an, an atheist materialist any day of the week, because at least they're 
kind of reaching for the idea that I'm not identical with my body. There is more to me, at least, than my body. I have a soul, I have a spirit. Now, of course, their conclusions about that are completely wrong. But that uh, even, even in the transgender movement, you see a discomfort or a dissatisfaction with this kind of lame, boring, atheist scientific materialism that we've been sold for a hundred years now, which is increasingly untenable. Yeah, these are, these are good ideas. Uh, you know, the transgenders are really, I think, just the natural outgrowth, Michael, of what I call original transgenderism, which is men acting like women and women acting like men. This is the idea of feminism. It, it's, it's there in Adam and Eve. And it seems to be the root, I don't know, of all leftism. I, I see, see feminism, it's, it's outgrowths into LGBTQ whatever, um, the last seven or eight years have been really, really particularly aggressive. I see it as motivating all of our politics. What we're trying to do here at Rules for Retrogrades and in our book, you'll be forwarding, is to shake the right wing by the lapels and say, what are you doing? Why have you been so off your guard? I mean, right. uh, for one thing, they've until very recently there's been no response to the social the so-called social issues by the right it used to just be i mean can you can you remember how the, those drab days of oh my gosh just think of our last three before before the trump days our last three uh uh nominates for on the republican side you know 2008 2012 to, it was it was really bad no one cared about any actual issues that motivated culture so there, there's sort of a return to that now. At the same time, in the vein of things happening first gradually and then suddenly, everyone in conservatism today, and even, I'd say, especially in conservative uh, Catholicism, is turning against liberty, free market, subsidiarity. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's alarming because it, the presumption seems to be that if you start caring about cultural conservatism, which happens to have happened in the last two or three years, that you can't at all uh, maintain right. your love for the ideas that have been mislabeled Whigism or classical liberalism. They're Catholic ideas stolen by the Whigs and the Protestants, but can't we retain both at once? Of, of course. I, you know, the, I think the, the reaction from some of these people who are now questioning the deeply held ideological preferences of conservatives during the fusionist era and the Reagan revolution that made a lot of sense for the Cold War, but maybe didn't make as much sense after the Cold War. What they're beginning to see are, are the effects of this kind of social neglect and a hyper-individualistic version of capitalism devoid of any transcendent moral order. And so they're reacting, right. I, I think, in a, in a, they're expressing a genuine feeling of dissatisfaction with that. And I, I don't begrudge them that, but, but they, they should be very careful not to ignore the, the real moral uh, center of, of economic thought and specifically That's property right. rights. Let's not forget Centesimus Anus, where Pope John Paul II describes free markets as the most efficient way to allocate right. goods and services. Let's not forget, uh, was it Pope Leo X? No, Pope Leo XIII, who described so, socialism yeah. as a pest, a plague, something to be rejected utterly, a wicked confederacy that steals the very gospel itself. I mean, that, that is not a call to try to relive the early 1980s as though uh, we can dig up the bodies of Bill Buckley and Ronald Reagan and reanimate them in this new era. They solved their problems. It's time for us to solve our problems. But we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater and lose sight of some of the greatest defenders of the faith and culture that we've ever had and their very clear views of socialism and against uh, modernism. And the, the one thing also I have to, unfortunately, my producers are telling me I have to go do my show now because it's five o'clock. So I don't want to, I hate to interrupt the stream just as Why? we're getting into the interesting stuff. But <laughs> yeah, look, yeah. I'd, I'd more than happily get not do my show today. But <laughs> no, <laughs> say, <let> no. Me. <laughs> yeah, no. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's been it's been amazing flown by. Uh, I, know. I know it's too bad. We could have gone, especially that I love that topic. We could have gone like another 20 minutes yeah. on that. But. Yeah. We, we need to do it. It's an important topic, and people are giving us, guys that give the answer you just made, or even some of the, the, the things I'm pointing to at in Catholic Republic, they're, they're giving a yeah, boomer, or yeah, neocon boomer kind of response. It's like, no, you don't Yeah, it's understand so, it's so frustrating with these guys, because I, like, 
I'm I am totally comfortable to say that this kind of hyper individualistic, you know, what we would call the neoliberal consensus is just total BS. Uh, but th- you know, you've got to root your alternative to that in in like human dignity and the right. uh, you know and the the great tradition. I mean, it's it, I I kind of feel the same way as as people who dabble with i don't know distributism or something it's like i get what you're getting at but you know come on dude like don't <laughs> we're, come on we're come on my yeah we're right we're right there man well we really appreciate your time could we impose on you really really fast just to do a little uh rules for retrogrades uh soundbite to take us out we really appreciate your time just yes. something like uh rules for retrogrades be there, be square. I, I I don't know what it is. What are, what are the kids saying now? I'm not. Uh, yeah, that, that's SpongeBob, yeah. Tim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, we we we'll actually use this if it's cool with you because we're going to be working with Mike Church on uh, Crusader Network. And yeah, if you just say rules for retrogrades, the book and the show out now or something like that. Mike. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. Cool. I'm Michael cool. Knowles here to tell you that Rules for Retrogrades, the book and the show, are out now. And you absolutely need to check it out before the Thought Police confiscate all of it and lock you away. <laughs> Perfect. We'll, we'll, we'll like go there. Thanks a million. Right. Thanks for your time. We're going to use that. And we'll, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks for everything. Okay, that's awesome. All right. Thanks, thanks guys. Sorry, I got a jet. All right. Thanks, all right, guys. Bye. Peace. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. We'll wrap there. Uh, yeah, the, we, we did. We didn't. Uh, Chris, you didn't ask your your Burke and uh, okay. uh, your Cardinal Burke question as he has paired and then separated with uh, Steve Bannon. We're gonna have to get um, Raheem Kassam on it and see if we can talk about that a little more. Yeah, that was great fun. interview though. That was fun. Yeah, he's great. Cool. All yeah. right. Well, uh, we, uh, thank you everyone out there. Please, please remember to subscribe. Uh, share. We need people sharing. Me and Chris were out there just yesterday at the uh, the the TLM at St. Vitus in San Fernando, and so many people came up to us and said, "Oh, you know, Tim, I love you on TNT. You've been gone. Where are you?" And I'm like, "Oh, I thought I thought word would spread. I thought you would know. Uh, we are on our own YouTube channel with Rules for Retrograde. So please, people, uh, come find us. And those of you who have subscribe and share. Sharing, I guess, is more important than I thought. And shout out We're, to uh, we all, we always say you know sign up to support us on Patreon. But thank you to all the people that have already supported us on Patreon. Um, so much. It's, it's so much. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Right. Thank you. You can't so do much. it without that. You can't do it without it. I, I mean, yeah. it's just. Uh, yeah, more more than when I was with Taylor on TNT because he was really handling everything behind the scenes, production wise and whatnot. It is an absolute scenic one on, and we are love. we are vastly important. You do feel the love. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Please tell it's your friends. Word it's... of mouth. It goes really really far. We need to build up um, by word of mouth. We just need to get the message out there that there's three guys that are going to be unabashedly telling the truth going forward and trying to evangelize the culture. Word. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, everyone have a great day. Hit subscribe. Uh, Here are Twitters. Here are Patreons to follow and uh, check them out. We'll catch you next time on Rules for Retrogrades. Peace. See you guys. Bye. Yeah.